Good evening. Did that frighten some of you? Well, welcome. Wonderful to be together. Do come in and come down if you want to. Um, but it's great to be together to worship the Lord. And whether you're here or whether you're on live stream, welcome for those on live stream. We are all part of the family, and I hope that you feel really part of today's service, um, even when you're on, on live stream. We're going to have some time to sing together, to have some open prayer time together, so do pray out loud. And if you're a bit uneasy about that, that's okay. You can say a hearty amen after someone else's prayer. And then we're very blessed to have Andy Kitto come and share with us from God's word about how Jesus has fulfilled all of God's plans for us. So really look forward to hearing from you, Andy. And then we'll lead on into communion. Elizabeth's going to lead us in communion together when we'll gather around the table. So a wonderful time of fellowship um, together tonight. Let's say with the psalmist, we're going to sing joyfully to the Lord because you are righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp and the keyboard and the drums and the violin and the guitar. Sing to him a new song. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Let's just come and quieten our hearts before him. Lord, you are a faithful God. And your word is true and is wisdom for us. And as we come and as we bring the whole of ourselves to you tonight, we pray that you would help us to leave aside the things that distract us. Lord, we confess them right now. We confess our sin. We confess our need of you. And as we come together to worship you and to give you praise, Father, we pray you'd also help us to receive your word to us through Andy and through the songs and through the scripture. Lord, that we would have ears to hear. And whatever it is you want to say to each one of us individually, Father, would you help us to hear it and help us to share it with each other so that we can all grow and learn together. So be with us now as we give you the glory. Amen. Over to Babs. We are excited to enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving, and that's what we're going to do now. So I invite you to stand if you're able. Get your clapping apparatus ready, because you're going to need it. And we're going to enter in.
As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room.
you here. Will you come and rest on us? Not by my, not by power, but by my Holy Spirit. Come and rest on us. Come from heaven. Come and fill us now. Sing Holy Spirit. Sing it as a prayer. time to commit ourselves afresh to the Lord, to surrender to him, to remember at this Easter time his sacrifice, to remember our first love when all we wanted to do was please him and worship him. Let's worship him as we sing this song.
Jesus, we believe in you. Jesus, we belong to you. You're the reason that we live. You're the reason that we sing. You're the reason that we're here. We need you. We love you. Our very life breath depends upon you. And Lord, as we bring our prayers now, as a, a group, as a body of believers, as family here at Millmead, hear us and speak to us and help us share our praise and our thanksgiving and our intercession now together. And even if you're on live stream, just pray out because we might not be able to hear you, but God can. So just encourage us just to call out your prayers and let's say a good amen at each one. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. You are seated. Father God, I thank you that we do not worship alone. Yeah. That we worship with believers all across the world. Yeah. And we thank you that your spirit is at work across the world. In places of good times, in places of comfort. Yeah. Father, I just pray as I heard from Pastor Sirhai today for the baptisms in Poltava this morning. For those six believers that have come to know you, that are showing light in the place of God. Praise Thank you, Jesus. I just praise you that your spirit is at work amongst the believers in that war torn country. Yeah, thank you. And I pray. I thank you too for that encouragement that I said about his youngest daughter, Sophia, praise was baptized. She gave that commitment to you. Thank you. We just praise you. Yeah. You are our work. Yeah. Across the world. Yeah, praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Lord, we thank you that you are enthroned upon the praises of your people. Yes. And as we just pray, Lord, you are enthroned upon the praises of your people everywhere. Yeah. We praise you tonight, Lord God, that you are the living God, that you have redeemed, reached into, man, into the world and redeemed mankind through your son. Thank you. We praise you, Father, you've poured out your Holy Spirit upon your church. And we praise you that through his strength and grace, you equip us to bring the life and power and might of the Lord Jesus Christ wherever we are. Yeah. Lord, we bless you tonight. We yeah. praise you tonight. We glorify you tonight. Mm -hmm. there. You are Lord of all, King of kings, mm -hmm. Lord of all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Amen. Amen. Father God, we praise you that you hear and answer us. Even those prayers that we haven't spoken out loud, you hear. And we thank you because of Jesus. There is hope. There is forgiveness. There is peace for our soul because of you. And we just bring the rest of ourselves, Lord, to you now. Uh, open up our hearts, Father, as we go on into the rest of the service. And maybe let's together say um, the Lord's Prayer together, our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Do be seated uh, if you haven't been seated already. So we come to our notices. And of course, we have this wonderful bulletin that you'll have seen. Um, if you haven't got one, they're out in the, in the foyer there, or they're probably on your devices. Uh, but we are busy, and we don't always read them. So we're going to just pull out a few highlight... Um, I'm not going to sing them, don't panic. A few notices to share today. And the first one, I think, is the membership classes. Um, there we go, membership classes, starting this Wednesday... And they're going to be at 7.30 in the chapel. I think Elizabeth has already sent out some emails to those that have signed up. If you haven't signed up uh, or if you haven't received an email, do come and speak to Elizabeth. These, this is a great opportunity to explore um, membership without committing yourself, um, but just to find out about us here. 
So that starts this Wednesday. And then we have a night of prayer coming up on Thursday, the 18th of April, through to Friday, the 19th in the morning. So we're going to start at 7 o'clock on Thursday here in the auditorium. And then um, we'll be here from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And then at 9 o'clock, we'll move up to the chapel and we'll be praying in sort of two hourly sessions. So come along for whatever you can of that time together. Um, as, we, as I said at the beginning, maybe sometimes you find it hard to pray out loud, but we can all say an amen. And God hears those prayers that we pray even when we can't speak them out. Um, so do come along. And, and if language is a problem, just pray in your own language. That, that's great. So come along on that night of prayer if you can. And at 7 o'clock in the morning on the Friday, we'll have breakfast together. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, so that's the night of prayer this Thursday. Uh, no, not this Thursday. 18th of April. And then just finally, we have a Watoto choir, which is a children's choir coming. There they are. Uh, coming. These are, are children from Uganda, and they bring hope and healing in their singing. They've got a wonderful strap line. We celebrate Christ, and we care for the community. So this is going to be a wonderful event. I think it's only the concert's just over an hour, and it's a combination of music, dance, and testimony. So do sign up. All the details are in the bulletin. So do sign up to that Watoto Choir. And that is, I haven't told you when it is. It's on Tuesday, the 23rd of April, 6 o'clock to 7.30 here in the auditorium. OK. So that's the notices. Right, we're going to sing a song, Purify My Heart. And as we sing this, if stewards, you'd like to pass the, the offering bags around, and then we will have a pray for the offering and for Andy. Let me be as 
ready to do your will. You accept us. Thank you that you accept what we offer. Though it may be small in comparison to all that you've given us, Lord, we offer it in love. And we pray that you would receive our offering and multiply it up to fulfill all your plans, Father, for your kingdom work. We praise you that you are uh, the God of generosity and kindness and overflowing abundant grace. And we praise your name and so receive these offerings. And Lord, as well as we now come to a time of uh, receiving your word into our hearts, we pray that it would have like a heart that's in, impressionable, like those butters that you stamp on the butter and it has a print on it. Father, as Andy brings your word to us, help our hearts be softened and ready to have that imprint that you want to place on our hearts today so that we walk away from tonight changed because of your living word. So we thank you for your word and for Andy. Bless us now as we hear it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. One of our key verses for this evening is one that I hope you will be familiar with. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And I've been counting on that to be true for me all week. Now then, uh, 4,000 years ago, God spoke to a man called Abraham and said to him, I'm going to make a great nation out of your descendants. And uh, kingdoms will come out of your offspring. Fast forward a thousand years, and King David is on the throne of Israel at the height of its success. But after David's son Solomon had died, things fell apart, and... The kingdom which took a thousand years to establish, well, the top half, three quarters of it, the nation of Israel, got carried off into captivity by the Assyrians after a mere 270 years. Both the northern kingdom and Judah in the south had exactly 30 kings before they were carried away. But the kings in the north were pretty much a rotten lot They did not lead the people in God's ways, so they didn't last very long. In the south, uh, they lasted uh, about 400 years before they were carried off into Babylon. You know the story. The prophet Jeremiah had said that after 70 years, they'd be back. And uh, God, who says things, he's better placed than anybody else to guarantee that what he says comes about. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, we're going to look at the stage of history where God's people have come back to Jerusalem and to the small area around Jerusalem. Things are not going well. There was galloping inflation and the crops weren't doing well. Frankly, people were struggling. And God's temple, which had been in ruins and the city of Jerusalem had been in ruins for too long, needed to be re-established. And so God sends along two prophets to stir the people up, to encourage them into action. One of them was called Haggai. I love his prophecy. It's only three pages. And here's one of the things he said. Be strong and work, for I am with you, says the Lord. He only spoke for about three months, before um, uh, he'd finished all that God had said, Trevor, could you bring me the clicker, please? And then uh, a much younger prophet by the name of Zechariah comes along and begins to encourage God's people. Thanks very much. Um, I want to say a little bit about uh, the nature of prophecy. Could we have the, uh, the first slide, please, Tim? 
The thing is, uh, when, when prophets receive visions from God, they can see things with crystal clarity, uh, uh, with wonderful accuracy, as we will discover in this book. Can you see some magnificent Scottish mountains there? I sailed past this scene last summer and have actually stayed on one of the islands in the foreground. But the point is this. You can see lots of mountains, some near and some far. You see a magnificent vista. But you can't really tell how far away everything is. And when I stayed on one of those islands, I took the sunrise coming over the impressive mountain and only a long time later did I discover it wasn't one mountain but in fact two and one was 30 miles away from the other. This analogy is to try and illustrate the difficulty that a prophet has in describing what he sees. He sees it with great clarity but he has, has little perception of the distance or in the case of un the fulfilment of prophecy the time schedule under which things happen. There is another um, aspect uh, to prophecy, which is this. Zachariah's prophecy, which uh, Amanda will come and read to us, if you'd be ready, please, Amanda. Um, half of it relates to the immediate future of the poor people struggling in Jerusalem and surrounding area, but half of it relates to the distant future, some of which has yet to be fulfilled. And Zechariah gave his prophecy two and a half thousand years ago. Now imagine these clownfish in our picture, whose entire life is centred around these sea anemones, which are poisonous, but they are immune to the poisonous tentacles. And when a predator fish comes along, they hide in those tentacles and they are safe and they spend their entire life more, not more than a metre or two away from their safe home. Imagine they were trying to describe what's been going on in Guildford High Street today. I believe there's been a vintage car procession up in the High Street. Now that is an absurd suggestion. Why? Because the entire framework of the life of those clownfish, delightful creatures that they are, made famous by a certain film. You might be able to tell me which one it is. Saving Nemo, is it? Yep. Um, they can only describe what they've experienced, which in their case is a very limited uh, thing. How much more are the prophet trying to describe something that's happening hundreds, thousands of years in the future. No wonder we find prophecy a bit tricky. And Zechariah, more than some of the other Old Testament books, is especially tricky. It's the closest book in the Old Testament to the book of Revelation in the New. And Zechariah is encouraging God's people and painting an exciting and glorious future for them to motivate them. In fact, he tells us more about the coming Messiah than any other prophet in the Old Testament, apart from Isaiah. Now listen to this. I'm giving you a little snippet from Hosea. He sees exiles from Israel returning, and he says, they will fly like a bird out of Egypt and as a dove from Assyria. I will settle them in their home. It's possible that that was fulfilled after the establishment of the nation of Israel in 1948, was it? But how could Hosea possibly have conceived of air travel and aviation all those years ago? But he remarkably describes them returning like birds flying. Some of you will remember the airlift of the Falasha Jews from Ethiopia to Israel uh, not so many years ago and increasing numbers have arrived back in Israel by air. How strange that the prophet could use that beautiful picture to convey something that he had no real sort of grasp of. It's time for me to stop. Amanda, take it away.
right, not all of it. <laughs> uh, from Zechariah 3, from the beginning. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua? There are seven facets on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Thank you, Amanda. The astonishing thing is that uh, God's people had been offering sacrifices in the temple for hundreds and hundreds of years, and that covered over the problem of wrong, of sin, of rebellion, of willful going against God, but it did not cancel it out. It covered, but did not deal with the root problem, which is why the high priest had to keep on offering more sacrifices year after year. And the punchline that Amanda read is this, I will remove the sins of this land in a single day. And we celebrated that last weekend with the first Easter, and we have the bread and the wine before us this evening to remind us of the high price that was paid, not only to deal with the sins of the nation of Israel, but all those around the world who are willing to surrender to Israel's God. Now, this passage which has been read, we feel a bit uncomfortable with. Why? Well, we've got a bit of an argument going on between a, a, a high-ranking angel called Satan, whose name means accuser, and another unnamed angel, I suspect also high-ranking. By the way, Satan uh, triggered a war in heaven, and he and all his followers, uh, the angels under him were kicked out of heaven. One third of all the angels in heaven were kicked out, and you can read about that uh, elsewhere in the Old Testament. I think it's the book of Isaiah. So we're not, uh, we're not altogether comfortable with talk about angels, especially Satan. However, his name appears in the book of Genesis. It appears in the book of Job. Uh, he appears tempting Jesus and he appears in the book of Revelation. So if you don't believe in him, you're tearing out a good chunk of your Bible. By the way, Satan believes in Jesus. You better too. I think the narrative of this high priest having a new suit of clothes is self-evident. But we notice that the high priest, possibly supposed to be the holiest person in the land, he himself was grubby. He needed forgiveness. He needed a new suit of clothes. If he did, how much more do we? Now, I'm trying as best I can this evening to give you a bit of a flavour for what's going on in the book of Zechariah. And if you don't know where to find it, find the Gospel of Matthew. Turn back three pages and you will come to Zechariah. In chapter 5, there is a strange picture of a figure in a basket with a lead lid. And this figure represents the sins of the people. And this figure is carried by air to the city of Babylon, which by now has been in ruins. And it's an illustration of God taking the sin of the land to a place far away. 
And as you know, Babylon re is represented in Bible uh, in numerous places. We find it in Genesis where it starts off as the place known as Babel or Babel. And that is where the men and the women said, come, let's build uh, a monument that reaches up to the sky. Let's make a name for ourselves. We want to be famous. And Babylon, that God's people were exiled to, was the world capital city of witchcraft and of paganism and idolatry. Basically, God said to his people, if you're going to worship idols, which they did increasingly as the um, nation deteriorated, God sent them off to where they could do that to their heart's content. And what, what happens? They were cured of that. But there is more. Chapter 12. I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. Here we get the first clue in this prophecy that this cleansing from sin is going to come at a high price. This word piercing comes. You need to know that when this was written, the, the Roman Empire hadn't existed and neither had crucifixion been invented. The prophet somehow could see it, as, as did David in the Psalms, where he says, they pierced my hands and my feet. But there's more than this. The people that had rejected their Messiah at the first Easter, a time is coming, still in the future, when they will recognise the incredible blunder they have made. Did you know that if you are a Jew and you believe in Jesus today, you are automatically ineligible for Israeli citizenship? Such is the hostility towards this figure, Jesus just in passing, there are two major conflicts going in the, on the world right now. One is Israel and Gaza, and the other is Russia and Ukraine. Do you know where the largest messianic church is in the world? The largest gathering of Jews who have encountered Jesus as their true Messiah? It is not in North London. Neither is it in New York. It is, in fact, in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I wonder if those events are all interconnected in some way. There, is, there are more clues to the price that was paid for our salvation, for our cleansing. I'm now quoting from chapter 13 and verse 1. Let's see. Can we have the, um, the PowerPoint on, please, Tim? Uh, let's move on. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. There may be somebody, some folks here who can remember the lines of this hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains, taken straight from this quote. So we find here that there is a, a blood covenant wrapped up in the cleansing which is foreshadowed here in this wonderful book of Zechariah. Later on in the chapter 13 we read this, Awake sword against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Here is a hint that the price for this cleansing involves bruising, inv involves a shepherd being hit, being pummeled, pummeled, being bruised, being hurt. Now what we are doing here is looking at a picture painted on a glass screen. And we are seeing glimpses of cleansing. And we've meandered through this book. And I've tried to pick out the uh, theme rather like succulent raisins in a perfectly baked fruitcake, where they seem to run all the way through. 
So here we have clues of Jesus, the one who is to come. And what we are invited to do in these prophetic pronouncements is to look through these pictures, these images, all of which convey an element of the truth. And beyond that, we see the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amanda, please can we have reading number two. Thank you. Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up, like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it, with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but my, by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. PowerPoint slide, please. Thank you. Now, uh, many of us will be familiar with this image of the Jewish candlestick or lampstand with seven arms. The one depicted in this part of the book of Zechariah is unusual in two respects. This lampstand has its own reservoir of oil. And furthermore, that reservoir of oil, which you can see somewhere in the middle, is connected to two olive trees, and the picture is presented of a continuous flow of oil from the olive trees to the reservoir to the lamps. And those two olive trees I, were, were probably engraved on the side of the reservoir, which the prophet saw. Here is a most beautiful and wonderful picture of a continuous, never-ending supply. Oil in scripture is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. In the tabernacle, there was a lampstand similar to that, and the lamps kept burning day and night. And the first application is that those two olive trees represent the two leaders of uh, the fledgling nation of Judah or Israel, namely Zerubbabel, who was descended from the royal line, from David. Josiah was his grandfather. And the other key figure is Joshua, the high priest. Joshua means God's save. That is the Old Testament name of Jesus, meaning saviour. Now, um, priests and kings were anointed with oil. That's true for our own um, king in this country. And the one who was to come, Jesus the Messiah, was himself anointed. Do you remember? He was baptised at the lowest point on the earth's surface where the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. And as he came up out of the water, having been buried under the water, something supernatural happens and the Holy Spirit comes upon him like a dove. I want us to notice this happens before Jesus had taught his first sermon or done any healing. Before he made a move, he needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, some of us, have been labouring hard and long to try and help God out in the work of his kingdom. What a big mistake. I'm reminded of Brother Yun, that dear Chinese underground church leader, whose story you can read in his book, The Heavenly Man. And he said, and I believe this is a word to some of us here tonight, 
Stop trying to do God's work in your own strength. Give up your personal projects because God will only honour his projects, not yours. And furthermore, if Jesus needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, anointed as both Joshua and Zerubbabel needed, how much more you and me. There's more to it, though. Joshua and Zerubbabel, their job was to encourage the people to rebuild the temple and in so doing, rebuild the nation's national identity and spiritual unity, uh, a place where God could be worshipped. So the primary job was one of bricks and mortar, not overly spiritual, you might think. Do you remember... Stephen in the Acts of the Apostles, whose job it was to supervise the distribution of food to the widows. They needed somebody who was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. I think that means that everybody sitting here needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit, regardless of what task God has called us to do. There's no distinction between the poor old chap standing at the front trying to preach and those who are serving food or servicing the food bank outside or even pouring the coffee after the service. My friends, this is our challenge. After this service, there will be opportunity to receive prayer. I invite you to come and bring your personal confessions to God and, and also to ask to be filled with, your Holy, with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit only comes to people who've been cleaned up, which is why the cleansing preceded this image. I'm now going to read three very short extracts, extracts from Mike Wakeley's book, The Amazing Story of the Christians in Pakistan. And all three have to do with tears. And we're going to come to tears in this book too. General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, was visiting India and was speaking in Amritsar. You may have heard of Amritsar. And his translator, his local Christian leader, began to weep as he was doing the translation. Sounds good to me. Why? Because uh, the translator became aware of the pride in his own heart. God can move in situations like that. And if you read this book, and you can read a review of it in the next church magazine. And uh, I've got 20 copies at home, all looking for new owners for a donation for the work of Starfish Asia. There was another occasion when some girls at a boarding school met together to pray. And one of them said, let's sing Psalm 51, wash me holy from my sins and cleanse me from my guilty stains. And they asked God to show them clearly where they had done wrong. And some of them began to weep and they confessed that they'd pinched things from the school's store. And the amazing thing is that that location was the same place where a great revival broke out not long afterwards. And then there's a man called John Hyde who became known as Praying Hyde and whom God used in intercession in a most remarkable way. He was told that he needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He was most indignant. He reacted in anger. After a few days of struggle, he had to admit that it was true. And, uh, well, I haven't got time to tell you the rest of the story. God met with him and used him in a most amazing way. I'm reminded, fast-forwarding, looking through this painting on the glass window to Jesus beyond, who stood up at the Feast of Tabernacles and said this, anyone who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Anyone who believes in me, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. My friends, it's, it's uh, Jesus who baptizes in the Holy Spirit, nobody else. And whatever Jesus brings is good. I'm going to skip over Zerubbabel and him being 
the one to put the capstone of the temple in place and how that is a link to Jesus, who is the capstone or the cornerstone whom the builder has rejected. I'm going to skip over the section about the shepherd who was called to look after the flock and he sent packing the bad shepherds. But the people rejected this good shepherd and eventually uh, the good shepherd said, well, how much are you going to pay me for my wages? Answer, 30 pieces of silver, the value of a slave. And that was used, it was thrown to the potter. Is this ringing any bells with anybody? You need to read this book. Amanda, I think it's time for you to come with section three, presenting Jesus as our coming king. Zechariah 6, 9 to 12, is that right? Zechariah 6. The word of the Lord came to me. Take silver and gold from the exiles, Heldiah, Tobiah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon. Go the same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Josadak. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. Zechariah 9, 9 to 11. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Zechariah 14, 9. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day will be one Lord, and his name is the only name. Thank you, Amanda, for doing triple duty this evening. Um, Tim, could we have the, the next slide up, please? Thanks, I'll, I can take it from there. Now, let me try and unscramble this rather strange scenario. Some uh, elder statesmen from Babylon arrive in Jerusalem with some silver and some gold. They come bearing gifts for a king, you might say. Some would describe them as wise men. Does that ring any bells? And uh, they are told to fashion the gold, which they brought as a contribution to the effort of building the temple, into a crown, which is placed on the head, not of the governor, who is descended from the king, but on the head of the high priest, Joshua. And a little ceremony takes place, and he's proclaimed the king. Now, this must have been a private ceremony, because if King Cyrus, back in in Persia gets to hear of this, he wouldn't, wouldn't be too pleased, I don't suppose. And we are told in the passage that this is symbolic of things to come. That is important. And why is this significant? Well, from Abraham through, for, the, for 500 years, God's people were led by patriarchs. For the next 500 years, through Moses and Samuel, they were led by prophets. For the next 500 years, they were led by princes or kings. And now in the fourth quadrant of 500 years, they're being led by priests. We need to remember that when Judah was taken in captivity to Babylon, that was the end of their identity as an autonomous nation until 1948. They were ruled over by successive global empires. However, 
none of those leaders, patriarch, prophet, and king, were entirely effective. In fact, they all had flaws. And uh, why did the high priest need cleansing? Well, even that office had become polluted in the late stages of the monarchy of Israel. Here is a photo or a replication of the breastplate of the high priest. He would go into the temple, to the Holy of Holies once a year, and to the temple pretty much every day, ministering before the presence of God. And this is a beautiful picture of the role of a priest. Can you see the names of the 12 tribes of Israel engraved on those 12 semi-precious stones? So he wore this on the chest of his very elaborate robe and he was basically presenting the people of God to God himself in the highest court in the universe. And Jesus, the one whom all this foreshadows and hints at and points towards, he is a king and we've just read the account of him riding on the donkey into Jerusalem which we celebrated two weeks ago. And Jesus combines the role of high priest and the role of king and indeed the role of prophet. And unlike all the others who had fulfilled those offices, Jesus did so perfectly without any flaws. We are nearly done. Two things. Amanda didn't read this, but on that day... By the way, that is a phrase you will come across a lot in the Old Testament amongst the prophets, and it refers to a day when God takes action, usually a day of judgment, a day of crunch, a day of change, a day when God uh, does his reckoning with people. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea in summer. And in winter, if you know the source of the River Jordan, you will know that the flow varies according to how quickly the snow melts on Mount Hermon. Not so the living water which flows out from Jerusalem. Now, Israel is at the northern end of the greatest tectonic crack in the Earth's surface, the Great Rift Valley, which runs for thousands of miles up through Africa. And uh, the Dead Sea is on that, where, where the Eurasian plate and the African plate, or the, the European plate, push together and go down and make that big trench. And uh, in Isaiah, here in Zechariah, and also in the book of Revelation, we discover that Jerusalem, which at the moment is surrounded by higher mountains, it has the profile of a saucer, Jerusalem will be rearranged and will be pushed upwards so that it's actually higher than all the other mountains. Otherwise, this prediction about the water flowing wouldn't work because water flows downhill, as you know. Do we have difficulty coping with such geological consequences, such uh, cataclysmic events? Well, let, let us remind ourselves that when the wise men came from the east at the birth of Jesus, strange things happened in the sky. Let us remind ourselves that when Jesus hung on the cross for three, six hours, for three of those hours, there was darkness over the whole land, probably a solar eclipse. And you have to be right at the center of that solar eclipse for it to extend for three hours. What person could possibly mastermind such, such uh, intergalactic, such cosmological ac actions? We're not talking bits and pieces. We're not talking crumbs here. We're talking about the one who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And what's the evidence that this living water is going to do its work? Well... In the book of Ezekiel, we read that by the time the water gets to the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea, which is one of the saltiest places on earth, becomes fresh. So much so that there will be heaps and heaps of fish there, and we're even told where the fishermen will throw their nets. This is a glorious picture of God restoring 
a messed up world and it's intended to encourage God's people to hold on because he is in charge. And in a minute we're going to celebrate all that Jesus has done. Forgive me if my exclamations have been, explanations have been a bit superficial. I've tried to give a bit of an overview. I've tried to whet your appetite because what I'm hoping is that you will find Matthew's Gospel, turn back three pages and unearth all the other stuff about Jesus that's there. There are ten aspects of Jesus, the coming Messiah, in Zechariah. I've only had time to look at a few. Thank you very much. God bless you. We're going to sing a song now that talks about Jesus being the one who stands before creation. He made everything that there is. Nothing is impossible for him. And uh, we surrender everything to him. So if you'd like to stand just before we uh, enter into communion, we're going to sing this song. <clears throat>
This is a meal for all who love the Lord Jesus, who are trusting in him for the forgiveness of sins. Please come round the front, round the side, and the back. That's right, come, come down. We come not because we must, but because we may. Not because we're strong, but because we're weak. We come because Jesus loves us and gave himself for us. As the apostle Peter said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. So we're going to begin with a prayer of confession, which will come on the screen. It's the general confession used by many, many churches. And whether this is the first time or the thousandth time we've come to take communion together, we begin with asking for forgiveness to come with clean hearts around this table. So let's have that prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So let's remind ourselves of Paul's instructions about this feast. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Andy is now going to give thanks for us for the bread. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you I like that grain of wheat which falls into the ground and dies. And uh, the harvest reaches millions, and we thank you for that. And we stand around this table not because of any intrinsic goodness that we have, mm. but because of all that you've done for us in yes. making us fit for heaven. We give you thanks. Mm. Amen. 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 So let's pass this bread amongst us now. And as you receive the bread take and eat in remembrance that Christ has died for you. Feed on him in your hearts and be thankful. Thank you. 
think uh, everyone has had the bread now. So let's now give thanks for the wine. Um, Esther is going to give thanks for the wine. And then we'll pass the cups round and we'll hold on to them so that we can all drink together. Esther. Mm. Father, we thank you for this cup poured out for us, new covenant, new promise for each one of us as we trust in you. And as we take this cup together and as we drink together, we remember that you are the giver of life, that you cleanse us and give us forgiveness and freedom and you bring us peace into our soul. We, um, we marvel at the cost of your spilt blood for us that we might be redeemed and forgiven and cleansed and sustained. Thank you for this cup. Amen. 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 blood of Jesus which brought about forgiveness of sins in a single day and we drink this cup together remembering Jesus blood shed for us and we are thankful Amen. My own. Be lovely to um, just stay here and sing our last song together before we um, go out in the Lord's strength, filled with His Holy Spirit, not by might or by power, but my Spirit. There's God's Spirit in each one of you. So let's sing this song together if you can lead us, Babs. And the, it'll be up on the screen, so wherever you are, just turn.
you to take your rightful place in our hearts and in our lives, in our thinking, in our giving, in our time, in our emotions. Take your place this week as we go into a new week. Help us to be people of the King, yes. uh, empowered by your Holy Spirit with all that we have heard this evening. Mm -hmm. And the blessing may now the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And let's say, Amen. 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 Praise God. So go in peace. There's tea and coffee. If you do want prayer, do stay around here. There'll be people who are very happy to pray with you. Otherwise, God bless you and see you again soon.